We are show. Welcome back to another episode of Can't Handle the Heat. It's your boy G Swizz. To my left, I got Jokesy Worsley. Jokesy, how we doing? What's up, everybody? Of course, and all the way in Ankara, Turkey. Micah Ma. Micah, how we doing, brother? What up, what up? But it isn't just the Dolos here today. We welcome on an old friend, a Long Beach State alumni, two time national champion, two time player of the Tough. year, played in Italy and now three years in Poland, the killer of Hawaii and UCLA's hopes and dreams. The TJ DeFalco. Thank you, TJ. <laughs> what an introduction. <laughs> Dude, as, as I was doing it, I realized I was like, wow, we've all lost this guy in the National Championship, all crushed our dreams. So thank you for that, brother. Glad to have you on here. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on just for that. It's awesome. Yeah, of course, of course. Hey, really really quick. Hey, so it's kind of getting that time. Me and Joe were kind of talking about this today. It kind of gets to that time in, uh, in Europe where it starts getting like the sunny days kind of start kicking down now. Like, and in Poland, I know I lived in Eastern Europe last year. Is it like kind of getting to that time where like the like sun goes down, everything's kind of gray now. You just kind of like you kind of go through your routine every single day for you. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we were actually decently lucky in my city uh, this year. Is it? It stayed. I don't know, mid sixties until literally the day time changed. Like when when daylight savings went away, it like got dark at four o'clock and like got real cold. And like the <laughs> shitty days, you know, you got overcast and it's not Dude. not very good or anything. Like that. And so that happened as soon as daylight savings came. It was like, oh, welcome back to Poland. So it was actually we had three three and a half weeks of decent weather. So it was pretty happy. That's nice. And then because because I realized I was like, all right, well, I looked up at the sky and I was like, this is gonna be the weather for ninety percent of the time I'm here, which is crazy. Just something I kind of realized. Um, but let's get into it here. Let's I, go into I, it. We're, go. Uh, today's focus is a lot on offense, but I have to ask before I know Gabe's gonna dive into it. TJ, you were born in Missouri, correct? Correct. So I don't know if you knew Gage and I were born in Missouri too. Fulton, we were, baby. We were born in <laughs> us two were born in Missouri. That's crazy. What? I, I knew I you lived in Missouri. Yeah, we were born in Fulton, Missouri, up in Jefferson County, I think. Uh, I have no idea, but that's yeah, awesome. <laughs> I knew you lived there. I wasn't sure if you were born there, but I'll, that's crazy. But yeah, we were we were born in Missouri too, but. Like I was saying, uh, I'll let Gage take it over here as we get. We're today's focus. This whole month, we've been talking a lot about offense, and we're gonna get into just you as an out, from an outside hitter's perspective. We talked to uh, uh, Ben Toniuti last week. Talked a lot about setting. We talked to Namir a couple weeks ago. Uh, T.J. Sander a couple weeks ago too. And so we had we had to get an outside hitter's perspective. I'll let Gage take it over here, but a lot on slate today. We don't want to hold you too long. Though. So we have a younger team here in uh, in in Germany here. And a lot of stuff we've been kind of dealing with all of us, you know, I mean, what, we're three months in the season, kind of like injuries and whatnot. And you yourself, one, I have two questions off this. One, with a whip of an arm like yourself, as, as I'm sure you've gotten that compliment many times before, <laughs> do you suffer from any shoulder injury? And two, how do you deal with any type of injury when you're mid-length in the season or your crucial part of the season and just kind of keep on keeping on? Yeah. Um, interesting, the, the timing of that question is I actually had my first shoulder injury this year at the beginning of the year where I strained the back part of my shoulders, like supposedly like the decelerators of the arm, which it slows it down. And it comes from uh, the whole year, eight by eight months playing last year and then going straight into the national team stuff and doing the same thing for the three and a half, four months, whatever it was, and no break. And just kind of keep keep the arm going as fast as it is going. <clears throat> And granted, to the you know shout out to the lifting people over in Poland, we, I've gotten a lot stronger and I've been able to hit the ball a lot harder, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. And so that the continuous reps that I kept putting myself under didn't allow for any rest, or I needed to continue the strength program and continue to strengthen the back of the shoulder, and it actually didn't wasn't strong enough to support as many swings continuous for the 13, 14 months, whatever. It just kept going. Um, so that, that, that's my history with my shoulder. I just had my first injury. Um, and the second question, how do you deal with kind of those injuries mid-season? I think it's what I learned a lot recently is that it's very important to not, which kind of sounds not as good when, you, when I say it out loud, but to not care <laughs> about the games, really. You really need to take time for yourself and understand you put yourself, your body through continuous stress for 14, 15 months, whatever it's been. And you need to just not play two games. Who cares what your team says? You need to focus on what's most important for yourself and your health. Um, that is the utmost of importance. And you need to just take some time off because that's 
the only way that you're going to really be able to recuperate fully is disassociate yourself from the sport you play for a small amount of time to really heal. I, two two questions going off that as well. First question, so so to develop like such a – well, you were born with it, but also, as you like you said, you strengthened it. So when you're doing strength training, when you're doing weight training, what are you specifically working on and what have you learned, like what muscle groups you need to focus on um, and exercises when you're increasing your arm speed and maintaining it? Also, how do you know when – how do you know like when – like you said, okay, this is one where I can kind of this is an injury where I can push through, but this is also an injury where okay, maybe I need to take those two games, maybe I need to take those three games. How can you kind of tell? Yeah, uh, I'll answer the second one because it's freshest. Uh, it, have you have any, has anybody ever injured a thumb? I, I feel like this yes, is the best, I have. best type of uh, like analogy there is. If you injure a thumb, it takes forever for it to heal because you whatever you're doing, you're always using your thumb. So that's why I use it like in the the deciphering process for my injury of what I need to do for it. You kind of, uh, you can, you can play through like a knee injury. You can play through like a, a quad or partial tear, a strain or something like that. If, if you, if you're able to, but for a shoulder, there's something that you use 95% of volleyball. It's not, it's not feasible, especially something that is like the capsule, the rotator cuff and something like that. It's no matter what you do, it's going to be working it and putting it under some sort of stress. And it's, so that the, the closest thing that I could related to would be, or like a toe. If you ever injured a toe and it takes four weeks to heal, like just barely stubbed it and it like, it takes forever. It's cause it's always being moved. It's always, there's never uh, any time for it to just set and heal and let the blood kind of continuously work through down the, the, the inflammation and all that stuff. Uh, remind me again what the first question was. When you're, you had kind of talked about your training in terms of, like I said, you had born oh, okay, with a God given gift and everything, but what do you train to <laughs> maintain and increase that arm speed? Yeah, uh, a good good point of focus is the yin and yang of the the, the joint, the push the pull. It pretty much, I would I would I would say probably eighty five percent of the people that go to the gym regularly push and don't really focus on pulling for the backside, the anterior chain or the posterior chain. They don't really focus on both of them, and so the pushing, the benching, the anything like this to get the the front side of the shoulder stronger is obviously very important because that's where the power comes from. That's where the, the torque and the, the ability to squeeze those muscles at a, a higher rate comes from. But then also the backside needs just as much support, if not more, to be able to deal with that amount of power that you're putting through that joint and that structure. So the the pulling motions, the, the eccentric motions, getting everything balanced in a way. Because you, you if you've ever had a, like a, a quad injury, you know you probably need to work a little bit more on your hamstrings because you need to balance out the, the balance of the body. So that that's what I, I kind of keep in my mind mostly is that it's a yin and yang. You have to work on both sides of the body in order to keep the balance. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, absolutely. That's And that's one <clears> thing <throat> I think that uh, a lot of guys learn, like professionally when they come over sees is like understanding how to get through a season is always the hardest thing. I see with a lot of guys who come over uh, straight out of college, is like understanding that it's not like a four month season; it's eight, nine months, and a huge, a perfect example of what you're just talking about, TJ. Too is I don't know. I'm sure you guys saw the video of uh, Leon a couple of weeks ago at the Super Cup when he like blacks out on the court. Like, have yeah. you, did you guys see that video? Go. Like, I oh, watched it live. How, how does how does he so. stay in the match? How does <laughs> how do they let him stay in the match? Like they did. They put him out. Because I, I was told that he went back in. We were in the middle of practice, and I— we, Dude, but they were slapping his head around. And the, it, when he came back in, like when they were celebrating, they're all touching his head. I was like, bro, what what is going on? Get a headbutt. Some, we came that out of practice gnarly. and saw the video, and people were like, oh, he went back in the match. I'm like, he went back in the match? No, no he, he didn't go back, back in. in. I don't— I don't remember him. Because I, 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 they were up 12 to 6. I don't think yeah. he went back in the match. I don't Simeon think so came in and But I was watching it live, and I watched because we went, went back and reversed it like eight times. Like, what the hell just happened? Dude. And imagine, did you see the guy that I think uh, yeah, one of the middle blockers? Or was it Plotnitsky? He yeah. goes and tries to pull, lift him up, and he's just a noodle. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was, it was Plotnitsky that seen him like and was like, oh. And you could just see like. Like immediately. Yeah. All the reactions were gnarly, but then the, I think it was the middle that went and like lifted his arm and tried to pull him up and like help him up. And he was and just like a, a noodle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just like, no way, man. 
Dude, yeah. there. I also like uh, the Turkish guys are saying like <laughs> that he's lucky he was playing on uh, Terraflex because they're like they named the gym here that's just like we just played there in a away game and it was like the gnarliest floor and they're like if he was playing there he could have died. Yeah. Like these concrete like floors that's whew, that could have been so gnarly. Uh, so crazy. The enough of that because I I always yeah, get, yeah, I yeah. start cringy when I start talking about that stuff. <laughs> but it's a perfect example like players over here you got to take care of yourself because you know some people watch out more than others for you. Um but TJ yeah. I want to talk to you like getting into you know obviously you growing up played a lot with Josh Tuanigan. We've had him on before and we've spoken to him. I wanted to talk to you just in general since you've been overseas now and played for several different setters national team uh professionally. Um, and what for you is most important sort of when developing a relationship with a setter? Like for you on offense, what have been sort of the keys for you to, in order to have trust and develop a comfortable relationship with setters uh, since, you know, um, being overseas and changing setters almost every season now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd say the best way to kind of develop a relationship is one – I think it's a little bit of a 50 50 one is developing an off court relationship. I think that helps a lot in terms of like getting to be able to have conversations beyond volleyball, you know, get, get a little bit closer in terms of, well, oh, how's your family? How you doing? You know, checking in, doing stuff. Let's go to dinner one night and whatever, and we'll have some drinks or, or water of course, but you know, ha you know, figure it out and kind of get, get it to a, a nicer layer of a relationship there. And then being able to, then that kind of transitions over into the relationship on the court where, you get a little sense of the body language, the the facial expressions, the um, the old ultimate confidence that he's putting out. If, if like how he's doing uh, in terms of mentally and physically, how he's feeling, whatever. But then also continuing in the match to revise your process and like if you're going to build him up, if you're going to give him a little push, be like, hey, come on, you need to be a little better in these situations. Or it's like. Hey, I'm, I need your help right now. And you know what? He's struggling mentally or anything. He's he's letting the stress of the game get to him. There's a lot of like relationship building um, and awareness that goes into, especially a setter, because without a doubt, being a setter is the hardest job on the court. You have to you think about all five players at all times, and then on top of that, you set your guy a couple times in a row, and then everybody else's facial expressions come into your mind. You're like, oh, I didn't get the ball. Blah blah blah. You and then the setters have to deal with all of that. On top of dealing with thinking about the game plan, the distribution, what the other team is doing, all that stuff, like the, the, the amount of things the setter has to juggle mentally is actually unreal. And so giving them that credit and understanding that and saying, hey, dude, I get it. You're, you're struggling, whatever. I got you on these next side out. Give me the ball and we'll side out and then we'll, we'll be good. Or any other way you can you know, find to help a setter's confidence and or mind binging back and forth. Just give them a little confidence boost and say, whatever and that kind of develops a relationship to or if he's feeling it he's flowing great job dude you're doing great kind of thing absolutely i love that and i i think obviously i'm a little biased mike is a little biased <laughs> we've argued a lot with gauge some like um different positions but you know specifically to you and your attacking what have you found out like most important about your ball that that you like, like your preferred ball. Cause we always say this all the time, like, especially with any camps we're working, like every, every attacker is so different. And they like ask for different things, more, more care, about sometimes some care more about the speed. Some care more about, you know, what the height of the ball at a certain point, like location, what for you has been like sort of the keys that you give to setters about, um, when you're like first kind of starting to work with a setter. Well, yeah, one of the is a good point you made it there at the end of the was the first thing that I kind of the first few pointers that I give to to a new setter developing. Uh, I would say one one easy point for me to tell them is try to beat me to the pin. Try to beat me there with the ball, and we'll see. And then that that really test the speed because my set's always been as fast as you possibly can, because then I can beat balls. I I can beat the block. I can see what they're doing. I can have it. You know, and I, and I have the arm to be able to do that. So the first, the easiest thing for me to say is, hey, if you're, if you're, we're a perfect class situation, try to beat me to the antenna and we'll see, we'll start from there. And if we need to go higher, we need to go a little bit more inside, whatever, we can figure that out. So, but the first thing is just try to beat me there and then I'll, I'll make it work. 
Who? On a high ball, what do you what do you? I know we t- just talked about speed, but on a high ball, what are you looking for in the blockers, and what are you aiming for usually? Uh, the first thing um, that it depends on the type of high ball it comes from. If it's transition or if it's a gross, you know, dig off forty meters away bump set, I'm looking for the the, the location of the set. But then if it's quote unquote a perfect high ball set situation. <clears throat> I'm looking out of the peripheral to see if a third guy is coming. And most of the time, if it's a, a like a more of an out of system high ball, then they, they will be coming. So then I try to look beyond him and see. I mean, it's fast. It's, it's kind of hard to do, but to see where the libero's position. Because if I then if I have the cut shot open or if I have um, do, like a campfire right in the middle. But then if not, and if it's a perfect situation, perfect set, perfect everything, perfect approach, then I'm just blasting as hard as I can under those fingers. You. Sorry, I think I cut you no, off. I no, I I I was thought talking. I really, I've never heard that before from an outside. Actually, they like beat me to the pin. I, and that's, is there any sort of when you talk about like the shape of the ball? Is there any type that you care? Or are you more like specifically mostly just more so concerned with speed and kind of being able to deal with situations? Because we were talking Tony Uti last week, and he was just talking about you know like as a setter for him. Like Ingepeth is one of the guys that he has always loved setting because obviously he'll do some crazy stuff every once in a while and he'll get pissed off about it. But for the most part, like any ball that gets thrown in his area, Ingepeth like has the ability to do anything with and yeah. and figure out a solution. I think you're, you know, you fit in that category for a lot of setters where like, you know, not a lot of hitters are able to say just fling it out there, beat me to the pin, and then I'll figure it out from there because. It has so much to do with arm speed. I know, like, I tell guys all the time, that's what, like, Milan Zarkovic, who we worked with at Hawaii a lot, that's all he talked about was arm speed and talking to the attackers about arm speed. And you see it's such a difference when a guy's able to get on a ball in terms of, like, how much trust you have in every single situation set in that. For you, what are some things that uh, that are important about just, like, overall – uh, stuff on the bic as well like for you is it more so speed or height because to be honest we're our team has had that conversation our club team right now here in germany is having that conversation like on the bic attack what is what is the more uh important thing in terms of um the system that you guys play right now with the bic attack yeah um i i for me speed doesn't matter so much because that we uh, few normally how teams run it i think here uh is there's one cl- one inside of a seven which is normally faster mm-hmm. almost the first tempo out of the backcourt and then there's like the, the over over the front one um and both are good because most of the time the speed of the pins is relatively the same so the, those blockers are gone but the most i think the most important thing for me is the location in, inside the three meter line and so some, some guys maybe don't aren't as gifted to jump or to just absolutely come in like a freight train and fly like broad jump or uh, or visions. Vision is another thing that's really difficult for some of the players. And so if, if I've been blessed with the ability to now get jump way f- higher and further than I have before. And so is, if you put the ball at three feet off the net, it's perfect. I'm going to go up and destroy this ball. But if you if you put it at seven or eight feet when I'm coming in, like because I have a full more than a full approach, I have like a serving approach to hit this ball, then that's when I get into trouble. When I'm when I'm, my eyes are up and I can't see the block and I can't see anything that's going on, that's when and it really gets difficult to run an effective pipe. I think. No, absolutely. And with your guys' club team, um, has it been? Uh, difficult to like when you when you guys first come together because this is a question we get all the time like when you guys first come together all this connection stuff and how quickly does it usually take um you when you go to a new team for kind of things to start clicking typically for you guys like all yeah. this, the big work and the speed of the set like typically how often does like fast does that usually happen for you guys or or for you personally too yeah i think when you when you get to a certain level of the game everything kind of gets in the beginning of the season, everything on it kind of gets generalized to a certain level. Like most sets are okay, going to be at five, six feet. That's kind of be like the base standard. The, the, the shoots are going to be probably a little bit higher than a seven, like a shoot tempo for the, or gap tempo. 
uh, it's going to be like a generalized. And then if you want something else, like a little bit different here and there, then that's just, that takes a week of practice. And then that's the new standard that you've kind of gotten, like, like, like I talked about earlier about the relationship with the setters. So speaking of offensive systems, um, you played in Italy. Now you play in Poland for the past, well, this year, third year. And for our listeners out there, which are the top two leagues in the world by far, um, have you noticed uh, or what would you say the difference is between offensive systems between those two countries? Is one faster? Is one – or are they the, the same typically? Yeah. Uh, no, this uh, it's an interesting question because we've well, – actually even players here now recently, we, st- we, we talk about – because everyone's trying to go for the, the conversation of who's the best league in the world, you know, who's the, got the best players and who's got the best overall league. And then that gets into the question of, uh, but the budgets are different and all this stuff and all, but uh, there's been a lot of consideration to that question exactly of who is the better league. And, and I think my answer um, would be there's very um, apparent differences in both leagues. I think a lot of Italian leagues, which are the the Italian league, is very apparent to even people watching it that maybe don't know so much about volleyball, is that usually there's like three, four, maybe five top teams, really good teams. They could all, you know, maybe interchange within those those rankings. But then here in Poland, nobody knows. It, it's a crapshoot every every game you go to. You come out uh, to these home, to home matches where there's three thousand screaming fans, beating on drums, honking on horns. And a team like Zaxa or Yashimbia could come to these teams, these teams' homes gyms, <clears throat> and just get absolutely flustered. And then all of a sudden, it's a 3 3 1, 3 0 9 for the, for the home team. So, what I think the difference between the two leagues, I think the Polish league is much more technical based in just overall volleyball training because all the, the, the Polish system for the youth and all the stuff is being good at volleyball because maybe they're not the most physical players. And then I think, uh, the Italian league is more of uh, buy the most flashy player and give him as many balls as you can and build teams around having a budget. Like um, it's pretty, I mean, Perugia is an incredible team this year, but they, they kind of started doing that where, and Lube as well, where they buy players and almost monopolize them. Like what, let's say what happened with Juan Torena, he was there for eight years and they bought him at like 20 years old something like that. And he just stayed there and was in the best league in the world and one of the best teams and all that stuff. But the same, the same kind of thing is what I think is happening with Nikolov is they bought him. He's what, eight, 19. I don't even know how old he is. 18, 19. And he's going to be there for a long time. And same thing with Garcia. And so I think those teams in Italy are more budget reliant than the sponsors they have to create the best team possible. And then that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean just the first six or seven, that's all 14. So I think that's the main difference for me is that the just the technical differences. And then you could, you know, there's so many good players in Poland that it's it's pretty hard to, to debate which one is the better league. Because, like, for instance, the question that always comes up is, well, yeah, Italy's the quote unquote the best league in the world, but Zoxel has won everything for the last three, two years. A team from Poland, two teams from Poland have been wrecking all of the the champions leagues and all those those cups and all those european championships and all that kind of stuff this is true so would you say that poland like polish coaches or the coaches in poland do a better job of developing the players just because they're not working with maybe top of the level or the next the next one up rather than like okay this was what this guy can do let's kind of max that out yeah, I don't know if it's actually has very much to do with the coaching staff. It's more of or the coaches that have coached the youth and for the years to come and all that stuff. I think it's just the fact that the you know, like you look at a guy like uh, Kubiak or now Bartosz Kolek or even uh, Philip Tom Fornal is a little bit different, but those guys aren't the most physical, aren't the you know the high, the tallest, aren't the whatever, but they make up for it in volleyball IQ and all all around game smarts, and then also just the ability to do everything in the game. And I think that goes into uh, like a lot of the other players as well. Is that, dude, all, a lot of Polish people are just freaking good at volleyball. Yeah. 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 No, that's the noticeable thing. Like, that's the most, you watch the, especially when you watch the national team, the, it's very evident there. Yeah. Like they say that. And then all the Italians will be like, yeah, but we won European championship and our, our national team won world championship. It's, it's always back before we hear, you hear that all the time. The, I have uh, some questions, Joe. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I, can I rattle it. some off? Yeah, go okay, for it. Okay, so uh, obviously we've like learned a tremendous amount uh, that we talk about, like me, Joe, and Gage, just year to year being overseas. Um, almost where you're like, holy, like I had no idea what volleyball was before getting over here in some mm-hmm. aspects of the game. What has been something that you've learned um, overseas this year and then last year? I don't know if you could remember in Italy that as an attacker – that you were like that kind of flipped the switch or that kind of was like a new perspective that you kind of picked up uh, that you didn't have while playing in the States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd say the, getting transitioning from Italy to Poland was definitely, there was a difference there because uh, when you play a lower level team in Italy, I think, like for, for one example, you'd get a fast, like a perfect fast situation where the middle's probably going to jump and commit or get a little antsy in the middle. And then you have a fastball to the outside. More likely, like probably 60% of the time, you're going to be a one-on-one situation. But here in Poland, the, 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 the coaching style or whatever has been told to these guys is like continuing to play the game away from the ball. Like the, the middle gets pops and, and then it goes a few inches off the floor and then all of a sudden he knows he's late, but he still works his butt off to get some sort of something. And so I've, not, I've, got, I've noticed that I've gotten a block a lot more in Poland from a guy going like this, diving to the side or getting in the discipline spot, but his body's like flying to the side is because the, the overall just the work away from the ball is very important. You know, that, that goes for even for hitter coverage, for, for liberos that hardly ever touch the ball. They always got to be moving around, covering, get, you know, work on the back row defense and all that kind of stuff. But I think the that is one of the big differences is that, the players, like I said the, before, the players IQ and just volleyball investment, like mentally, is just a little bit higher, I think, anyway. That's a really good point. I think, like, they talk about off-the-ball um, abilities in basketball a lot. And, like, oh, this guy's really good off-the-ball. Like, he doesn't need the ball in his hands. He's still able to do a lot of things. And we never talk about that in volleyball. So I think that's pretty – and I think especially with the style of play happening now um, where teams like Poland and Italy are playing really clean team volleyball uh, where like six guys are pretty ready for everything and especially in block and cover. I feel like block and cover has been something that's changed the game so much in the last five years. So that 100%. makes a lot of sense. Like off the, off the ball work is, is a lot more important than people think. Uh, another thing that you talked about was just your ability to be more physical. Um, is that something that is just natural and that you're just growing into your body more and more every year? Or is there something that you've changed weight wise or nutrition wise or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my second year in Italy would have been two years ago is really when I, I started to realize that I wasn't really going anywhere special. I just was kind of, I felt as if, Performance wise on the court, I was somewhat plateauing um, and there had to be something done. And so then I went into the, the journaling situation of like, okay, what is there to be done more? Because I go in every day, I'm doing extra work, passing work. I'm working on all these things. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And it came to the realization is like, dude, you're still 187 pounds. Mm-hmm. There's got to be some sort of change. And so then I, that's when I started in, in Italy is probably the best place to do this is I started eating healthy. I already been eating pasta and chicken for every meal of the day, four times a day for months on end. And then I started to actually taking the weight room serious for once in my life. And that year I put on 22 kilos. No, 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 way. no, no, no pounds. No way. No, no I put on, I put on 20 kilos. That's like 40 pounds. That's like 30 pounds. kilos. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I was like one, no, one, wait, one, what? one wait, 182. What? Oh. Yeah, I was like 182, 183 leaving college and, co- and playing over in Italy. And I'm Holy 217 you're 223. Right you're oh, 217? Holy, holy yeah. cow, that's ridiculous. A pure muscle. You ain't got any fat on you. Oh, my <laughs> God, this guy. Oh, what? Yeah. Hey, pasta and chicken, boys. Pasta and chicken. Oh, pasta my God. Chicken, where it's at, I'm telling you. Holy, holy Hey, good for cow. you, man. Mad respect to you, TJ. Dude, didn't Kyle wow. do – like, I didn't go to the national team uh, – after well for a while now i don't remember when but somebody was telling me that kyle ensing in israel got massive is that massive. true bro how he, heavy he was, was he? like he was like literally like the same type of situation that year in israel 
he was like, I don't know, 198, 200, something like that. Because he was always, he's 6'7", he's a bigger yeah, player. Yeah, and he's sturdy. Yeah, and he's a bit, yeah. And he came back into the national team gym after just destroying like uh, protein shakes and like just eating like a madman. He's 237 right now. <laughs> and flying. <laughs> two, two and 40 a is monster. Heavy, dude. 240 is he- Okay, okay. So that leads to my next question. <laughs> uh, which I didn't stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, relax. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I, I got, I got pretty strong and bigger, but my knees like really started feeling it. Is there? Mm-hmm. Did you ever cross that where you're like, okay, I feel great, but now like every jump, I'm landing with 25 more pounds. In your case, 20 kilos, which is an insane <laughs> amount for, for your knees to just be like, okay, I'm all of a sudden ready to handle this. Is insane, like Zion Williamson type stuff. How, yeah. Did you have to do, like, how did you, you, your knees stay healthy with putting on that much weight? Well, yeah. Thankfully, I mean, still, it's pretty apparent when I'm playing. The only real place that I really put on a lot of that weight is in my legs. Quads and hamstring. Like, I just worked on them. Like, I started squatting like 200 kilos and it was just like going crazy. So, like, my squads are definitely sort of like were the first thing to be developed to be able to handle that. Of course, like that makes the most sense. If you're able to put them with that much force out, you got to be able to handle it at some point. So, I, I, of course, I'm still dealing with some knee pain and whatever, but it's not nothing out of the ordinary. But it's right. like that—that that was the most important thing. If you're wanting to put on weight, you have to be able, to, like you said, to handle it. Right. Yeah, that's smart. Okay, so for people that are going to be out there trying to put on weight, maybe it's also about the place you're putting on weight and then also the the order you're putting on weight like you'd want to build the legs up before building up maybe if you want to try and get bigger in your upper body you should definitely reverse that order and do legs first so that they can kind of hold it up definitely definitely especially for a jumping sport um yeah i mean you you, i don't want to i'm not going to bash my friend but you look at a guy like kyle russell who did upper body only for two years straight like looks damn good though Looks damn good with a mustache damn too. Good. But and that'll get oh, yeah. you a contract in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I always said, dude, I always said I was like, dude, if you're six seven and you're somewhat of an athlete and you get jacked, you got a good <laughs> shot to make some <laughs> good money <laughs> in volleyball. Never played a day Korea. of volleyball. You never do but damn he looks good. <laughs> you hit two balls in the tryout. <laughs> As hard as you can, and you flex <laughs> on the way back to the hit, back of the hitting line, and you're set. Wear yeah. an American and bandana. Even the, and even I, I believe, like I'm pretty sure, if you, and that's not Kyle Russell, by the way. Kyle Russell, I'm. This is a different thing. Kyle Russell's got game, but um, if you don't perform well, don't they? They can send you home, but don't they have to pay you like 33 percent? Of your contract or something, isn't that? Yeah, because I think I think how it works. I heard about it a few, couple of years ago. Is like a draft, right? So you put your name in, right? And then if you get accepted to the draft, then teams will pick you or bid on you or whatever, right? And then that's kind of the money they're already obliged to pay, whatever. But if exactly. they decide to cut you, then yeah, there's there's a they have to pay. To pay. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure yeah. you can make like a hundred grand in for a three single weeks. day of practice. By lifting upper body and going with, <laughs> like, you know, like the full yeah, underperforming. Mus- go for the muscle show, three weeks, 100 grand. <laughs> On, and make sure you suck. Yeah. He, led, he led the whole world in aces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he, the entire no, his, world. Dude. Oh, some, he went off. Yeah. He was bomb. I, I, even in the yeah. world championships, he came in and had some huge serves. Clutch aces. Yeah. Huge serves, which is. If you've ever been a serving sub, you know how impressive that is. Like, yeah. wow, that was legit. That was legit. Like a few in a row, I'm which is even him. more important. But yeah. I want to say one more thing about that comment about uh, about training the legs first. And there's just one more like aspect of that, that for the people out there listening. Definitely need to understand that lifting legs, just lifting legs, isn't going to be automatically all the protectors and all the supporting elements of a knee, of an ankle, of all that stuff. You have to train those little, the patella tendon, the Achilles and and the peroneals all the all down the side of your leg all need just as much attention as the big muscle groups as your hamstrings and your quads, because if that, if they can't support it and you have a giant quad and you're trying to jump, that's your knee is going to be the first thing to go because the extra weight you're being able to put out force that you're not really able to withstand in your joints, and it's that that the 
the supporters of all these muscle groups need to be just as much in, like focused on as opposed uh, as the, the muscle groups themselves. One million percent. That's a good point too. Um, so also we were talking about like something that you'd learned while being overseas from Poland to Italy. And that was the off the ball work. Is there anything more specific? I feel like out of system attacking has like become pretty almost standardized in a weird way, like where it's almost easier for the block at some points, like in Poland, high ball, I know I'm closing the line. Like they're coming for, and I can almost like make a move a little bit because they're coming for that outside hand and like less people are attacking that seam, which yeah. they could get away with because now it's like so standard. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this block because you're just going to hit it here or yeah. they're going to attack the third man on block and like, or they're going to block and cover. Uh, is there any like chink in that game that you try and play with, or is it pretty like is your kind of standard? Obviously, you have the arm to make a different decision, and that is bomb the ball. But yeah. uh, is there any like decision making process that you have outside of those kind of? And for those people that aren't playing overseas, which is a lot of people out there, like what are those shots that you've developed more throughout your overseas career? Whether it's like the throw into the low triangle or like just these types of things that we know and we've watched because we've played against it, but like people in the States aren't using these shots. And yeah. uh, what was that shot development like? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first, because I have, you, you brought up a great point and I have a bunch of different thoughts on it. One of the things that I, that I think the, some of those volleyball fans that are at least into the watching of volleyball now, one of the greatest examples of why I think Poland uh, is one of the better places in the world to play is because take take Zoxa for instance, going up against the gnarliest teams in the world, not that physical of a team, and they play block and defense like no one's business. They play block cover, high ball cover, 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 cover. We're gonna get a perfect cover and set the middle and kill, and we're gonna beat you like this. That is their game, and that's how they've won two two, two Champions League in a row. It's just like, dude, we will out volleyball you 100. percent And that's what makes them so gnarly as a team is that they're not the flashiest. No one on their team bounces balls. No one on their team goes up and just like this and just absolutely stuffs balls. They're, they're very volleyball oriented, which is what makes them so fun to watch. It's like that and they're a great team together. They play, like you said, mentioned earlier, they play really good team volleyball. And so that, uh, the, the shot, shot, shot selection that kind of comes with being a high ball attacker is definitely coming in prior to the game with, with something in your repertoire that you know you'd be able to pull out. Like you said, the throw into the triangle, the recycle or the high line go off the center's hand and they know he's going to be kind of <laughs> making this move or just the blast high. But then also another thing that kind of comes into play that is maybe for a little bit more of an advanced player is understanding what happened and what the players did before. You have a player like Taylor Averill who goes up the block and 50% of the time he's like this <laughs> at the net. You have to understand that that's what he's going to do. And that opens up a free lane. You come in strong and hard and blast it in the middle of the court. It's a point every time. You have an you have an uh, an outside that swings block hard, swing block hard, and like fake pumps it and like doesn't go or does the same thing and pulls. That's great information for you, but you have to set that up prior. So you got to do a couple of high off blasts off the fingers. You're going to get this guy to think, oh, he's going to do that again because he's done it two times already in the match. You go in and you put a ball right in the middle of the court, thirty percent to point. So that, being aware of the chess game that's kind of going on and what players are doing, what players are thinking as well as being able to use your eyes as well, like as fast as you possibly can. That's a huge thing in volleyball to recognize the third guy's way back there and he's trying to catch up and he's like lunging like this. And you're going to probably going to have a sharp angle open or everybody's sending like this and he's going to go like this. You're probably going to have high fingers. You're not going to have a throw because there's not going to be any triangles or the, or the middle got caught up or something is coming out hot. You have that throw into the triangle. Like there's, there's so many different cues to pick up. And I'm, and, 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 and I understand that it's, Volleyball is a very tough sport, and doing something like that is asking a guy to pick a target behind the wall and hit it. You know, like I understand it, but that's kind of what goes on in my Those mind. Those are the concepts. The, yeah, the concepts, exactly. <clears throat> it's like that's – you got to be able to be – will not. you got to be willing to not have a perfect hit every single time. That's what, what it kind of comes down to. you got to find the, the solutions. Gotcha. gotcha. Those are kind no. of mostly most of my questions, guys. Yeah, no, I – I have one more, and I know it's late, uh, especially for Micah too. But w for you, now that you've played in some of the biggest or the biggest competitions in the world, you've played against 
pretty much most of the top players throughout the world. What are the things that separate good outsides from like the top outsides that you reckon? I mean, you you've spoken about a bunch of different things, but what are like the like if there's like two or three things that from the top outsides that you recognize that they're really good at, kind of the small things that people might not recognize. Yeah. Um, one of one of the top things that I would say for the those outsides is having the ability to understand when the set's not good and it's it's not the optimal situation to try to kill the ball and earn the point and get let the ego rise up and be like oh, I'm going to save the team I'm going to do this or that could that doing this could mean a bunch of different things but when it, it comes when a, a ball ball is patient the outside hitter is very patient and understands that hey this setter bumps at this ball backwards 37 feet away probably not the best situation unless it's obviously a perfect set to go up and try to hammer a ball because the odds of that happening either you're going to smash it out you're going to miss you're going to hit in the net or they're going to block you because they've had three years to set up their block so the ones that are patient and able to see and either throw the ball in or even even when it doesn't happen like uh for the recycle to put it on the center mm-hmm. put it on the center takes out their entire offense for giving them a free ball you know the next the next thinking the next the ability to put together that hey this is not a very good situation I'm going to try to put my, my team in the best possible situation that I can without ending this point one way or the other. That makes a lot of sense because I feel like there's only, there's the main two categories of it would be like physicality that you're just blessed with. So you have a gnarly arm or you're jumping super high or you're super tall, like physicality and then decision-making. Yeah. Like, and so the thing that, normal people can work on would be decision making who would be someone uh if you had to name like two players i I maybe could guess them but who would be the two players that you would say to players out there to try and watch and emulate their game off of or not emulate their own game off of but uh i guess just watch and just take in information from yeah um we had jiba yeah that was pretty sick That was, uh, yeah, that, that's probably a very good answer. Uh, one of the other players that I, could, I, I get to watch because he's playing in this league is that I maybe not the biggest fan of or whatever, but uh, I think Cleveno is pretty spectacular at that because he's not the most physical guy, has ball control, can do it, all the all the facets of being an outside hitter, setting, digging, whatever, serving. But when it comes to attacking, he's either recycling this ball and getting his team a situation to set a person like Boye or uh, who's the other guy? Sure, uh, Fornal oh. and Hadrava and all those guys. Like those guys are the big physical hitters that are going to go up and just hammer balls. <clears throat> and so he's not the, he, of course, he takes the points where he gets them and he gets a lot of the points. But when those situations come and he's slicing and dicing you down the line or he's, you know, flat, like float serving balls into the middle blocker's hands and coming back like this perfect pass reception and it's like you got to play first first pass defense against this team again in the same rally uh he's a really good one i think um i give a lot of credit to him um i don't know anybody else i mean there's so many other yeah think. there's that's a really I mean, good oh that... another one i think for sure is stupid that i didn't mention it is sleeve Sleeve he's incredible at that in all facets of the game. And also another one that's just like him, I guess, now that I'm just rattling them off, <laughs> is, <laughs> is Uros Kovacevic. He's yeah, insane uh, at finding the gnarliest situations. To, look, he's more of a killer than he is like a recycle guy. But man, he slices yeah. and dices everybody in the world and jumps like this high. Like, yeah. unbelievable. He's, I, I don't know if you've watched Gage play uh, grass very much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Gage plays so much like Kovacevic in the way that he just goes under. He just hits as hard as he can on the tape. And the tape on the grass is so soft that like <laughs> it's actually impossible stop. to stop. Dude, the last three games we played at Wapaka, like the teams we were playing, every between every point would tighten the net because they were getting so <laughs> mad. Because you get, tell me not, Gage. Is that Joe? They were doing <laughs> that. That's true, that's and we were true. like, dude, stop, I don't know, stop tightening. Thank you. Stop tightening the net. And they're like, dude, this guy's so annoying. And they're tightening the net. I'm like, dude. <laughs> It's probably so frustrating, but I don't know. I was just thinking, like, there's no one that's, there's no one in the world that's getting as many. I don't know what you guys call like this ball that comes under, the under block. like jeter or jetin or something like that that I've been hearing around. I don't know if that's a thing, but 
I've n- I've never seen someone get more than Kovacevic. He's like, and not get blocked. I'm like, how is this guy sneaking on everything underneath? You blocked him, Micah. You blocked him. So we put it on TikTok. Hey. <laughs> TikTok, <laughs> famous, baby. TikTok famous. <laughs> oh, so, TJ, I have a few more questions for you. TJ, you should you should have said the most. The player I would watch is me. Uh, I was waiting for that. Who's She's the like, best? Um, me. Um, me. Uh, <laughs> no one comes to mind other than me. No <laughs> so, all right. So you you went all right. So the last time we interviewed you, unfortunately, was after maybe not the best Olympic games for Team USA. But the biggest thing in Nemer when we talked about this was okay before those games. I think Aaron Russell was down. So okay. TJ's gonna have to step up. You were maybe getting all this flack and all this people being like, "Oh, all this, all this and that, all all this crap from fans." Um, and you go and you ball out and basically you shut the haters up after the after the Olympics and everything. And then now you go from being the guy who has to prove himself. And within about a year and a half, two two year period, you're now like especially during like VNL and everything, you're you're the guy like for sure. I mean, you're they had you playing. First of all, my question is, what was that process like? Second of all. How did you find yourself up on the opposite uh, in the championship game? Yeah. Uh, the process with that, which it's, is one of the things that I pride myself on or or whatever is, to, dude, and I mean, I'm sure all of you have dealt with it at some point in time. It's like, dude, nobody else's opinion matters, literally at all, which is the world's biggest, like, uh, what's it called? Cliche. No, I, their opinions don't matter. And everybody always listens to the opinion. But... And in, in all honesty, the the most detrimental thing someone can do for their own mental health and mental well being is listen to what other people think of them. In all facets of life, this could be in school, and you're going and listening to or hear some rumor or something, or in any any whatever situation, listening to anybody else's opinion of you is the worst thing you could possibly do. And that's what I recommend to everybody to like start realizing that's kind of and at first, the first thing to do it is realizing that's what you're doing because if you don't Accept and accept and realize and understand that that's what you're doing with your own mental awareness and space. It's just it's just negative poison that you're filling your brain with. Um, and so for me, that was like uh, one of those things. Like I, I talked to you guys about was that I was definitely dealing with that I was 100 percent telling myself not to deal with, but was still dealing with it. Right. Um, and that it, it, when it finally came to fruition, that it was like, dude, who cares, man? Who cares what uh, the only thing that I care about is how I'm doing, how I'm progressing in my physicality, you know, my, my, my well-being of my body, my mind, you know, that's the only thing that I care about. And, and then it slowly started to get where I was more occupied mentally with how I was doing currently with my trainings, with my progression and how I thought it was going as opposed to what everybody else was saying or what I thought they were saying, God forbid. And so that, that, that's when it kind of turned the corner a little bit. It was like, dude, I don't even think about them anymore. It's like, whatever. They can say whatever they want. You've been able <clears> – <throat> have you been able to keep that going? Or are you sli- do you slip? Obviously, there's probably slips. Everyone slips. And then what are, like, some cues that you have to when you do pop back into that headspace to kind of jump back out of it? Or are you, you're like, I'm good. I, I actually don't have that problem anymore. Yeah. I mean, like you said, everybody has their, their moments of, of slip and weakness depending on the, the circumstances. Um, and this segues almost perfectly into the second question, Gay Chad. Um, that was the most recent and the one, the only one that I've had in a long time was on the bus to the final. Like, holy shit, we are, this is the biggest match that I've ever played in my entire life. Okay, you, people say that the Olympics... Bigger than the Argentina match? Bigger than the Argentina match? Uh, yeah, I think okay. so. Because that, I guess the only reason I think, I in my mind that I say that it's bigger is because... <clears throat> The Argentina match was still group stage. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to the final of VNL. We played five weeks, four weeks to get here, mm-hmm. put in a whole shitload of work, and we're here now. It's now it's time. We're on the bus, ready to go. And my mind wouldn't shut up. And like I, I, I think also a combination of too much caffeine and you're going to the biggest <laughs> match of your life. It <laughs> was like was like oh, my hands were shaking and I couldn't stop thinking. I was like, dude, what if? What if? What if? What if? all this stuff. And it was like, so surreal. I felt like I was watching myself in the third person, like warming up for the match. It was just like, dude, what is happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> so that was actually the, one of the biggest things that I dealt with in that match. And it's the reason 
I had a little bit of trouble there in the first, I don't even remember when I got pulled to two second set, maybe when we or in the middle of the second set, when we were losing, I got pulled and we lost that set and down two zero in the final against France, a team you've already beat twice this summer or once this summer. And just like, dude, what is going to happen? I'm sure, you know, John was feeling it or whatever. All the guys are just like, dude, we just lost or down two zero right now to France. And it's like, France is one of those teams, if you give them any type of leeway, they're just going to capitalize on it. That's just kind of their mantra as a team, especially with a player like Irving over there on the other side of the net, just w- going like this to the fans and getting crazy and just like just being a complete knucklehead. That's what they're going to do. And so coach comes up to me in the before the third set even starts, and he goes, so I got a, I got a question for you. Do you want to go back out there and as an outside – and, you know, help us out whatever wherever you can, or do you want to go out there as an opposite? Just like, what? Like, you, like, because Matt was struggling and then, or, yeah, Matt was struggling and then Kyle was, just didn't even get put in the question. He was like, we need you back on the court, but what do you want to do? I was like, uh, I guess I'll play opposite. And he's like, all right, you're going to play opposite. We're starting in row four. Like, what? Did you practice that at all? Like, was that the first time? Nope. Good man. You Not know what's nice time. about that, though? I feel like that's happened – well, it's happened to me a few times with just the setter-hitter thing. Um, so, But I guess at the end of it, it kind of loses its – this advantage. But what's nice about it is that you have way less expectations on yourself and you play so much freer because you're like, dude, no one expects me to be good at this. I can oh, do I whatever I want and I can only win. Like, it's a win-win. I go out. I swing at balls. I kill them. I'm, I did great. And if I didn't, I got, dude. I was playing opposite. I didn't practice this one time <laughs> in my life. It's the biggest yeah. game ever, and I still the went for it. Like at least I went for it, and okay, I tried my best, and it was it didn't work out. It's not like you have this identity connected to like, if you're gonna fail, then it's like, oh wow, well like all that work I put in, and like maybe I'm not good enough, or whatever questions you could think of yeah, as an yeah, outside yeah. going back out there. You erase them. When you're going in as an opposite, you're like, ah, I don't have any expectations on this. I'm just going to play. Yeah. yeah. Then that and then also the fact that I didn't have to worry about passing was just like I took yeah. this 30-pound vest off and just put oh, it over there. And it's like, wow, this is great. Yeah, I should be an opposite more often. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, hey, easiest, easiest, spot, easiest position in volleyball? Opposite? I mean, yeah. They, they, all they do is hit balls. That's true. That's true. But so, so you had mentioned on the bus. I have a few more questions. I have two or three more questions that I'm gonna play one quick, really quick game, and then we'll let you go here. But um, so you, like you said, you like to be try, and I think Micah and maybe Joe's the same way. Like you like to be like really calm before the big matches, right? But for me, I'm the complete opposite. I like to psych myself out, like to like catastrophic levels, like to the point where I'm like. And if I'm not nervous for this game, I'm not ready. Like, I'm thinking in my mind, I was like, I remember, especially in college, I'm like, there's some games where I'm like, if you don't, like, especially if I had a bad game before, I'm like, if you don't pass this ball, your mother's going to hate you. Your dog's going to die. Like, I'm like, you'll be a failure to everyone and everyone dies. The whole state of Hawaii is going to hate you and all this. So before a game, I'll be shaking. I'll be like, and anytime I get relaxed, I'll be like, uh-uh, you're a failure. No one loves you if you don't get back to the ball or something like that. And I would come in with the, and, and I and I fully believe, it, like, it works for me. It's like a fully, because if I go out there and relax, my brother can attest to this. If I go out there and I'm super relaxed and everything, then yeah, I have a higher tendency to screw up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and Micah too, yeah. Like, unless I'm like, that's why I like in playoffs when I'm like amped up. That's why like I can do better, right? But mm. I'm just curious, do you like to kind of like take the opposite approach to that and just kind of be relaxed? Um, I feel like it's, it's shifted a little bit throughout my career uh, in college. Uh, when we were going to those big matches, definitely it was like, all right, I'm just going to settle down, settle the mind down and just be as calm as possible. Um, but now I don't say that I'm like, to the point of like stoic stoic i'm not like that i think <clears throat> i listen to like some of the hardest music on planet earth when I'm, I'm jamming and listening to whatever music i'm listening to drinking a couple coffees whatever but there is a limit to uh, there is definitely too much of either caffeine and or the mental psych that kind of goes into that that is just like detrimental like real bad but what's nice about 
I can I can get really fired up and have a great warm up, and then all of a sudden that kind of all that kind of calms down. And, and which is weird because you only, you're only warming up for 15 minutes, whatever, and you're, we're, you know, running and blocking and whatever. But the pepper, pepper is a big tell for me. Like if if my pepper is good, my ball control kind of feels like oh yeah, big doing time. it without without thinking about it, and like the the hand contact is there. It's like dude, this is gonna be great. And I go into warm ups and I actually <laughs> hit like shit in warm ups. I'm like oh dude, it's gonna be a bad game. It's like oh yeah, you no, can feel it. Yeah. How how do you? I feel the exact same way. That's why, how do you like get yourself, like when you feel it, is there any way for you to turn it around in a sense, I guess? It's like, Dude, oh, as a, are you just like, I'm on a dude, sinking ship. Dude, I'm going back. Dude, as a passer. There's no chance I'm going to have a good game. I'm dude, out. Dude, as a passer, dude, I'm like, all right, Joe, get ready for some three meter balls, some bombs up in the air. No matter what they throw at me. Here we go. Get ready to run. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think there's there's really only one way to kind of settle it down when it's just like you said, you're just sitting, just standing on a sinking ship. I think the best way for that is just to get comfortable in the match, find your rhythm with whatever that means. With with Liberos, I'm sure it's like you you take the the two or three three meter balls and you're like, all right, that's good. And then you get the one good pass and then you stick it. Yeah. And then you have maybe two more three meter balls, but then you stick two more two in a row next and you get a dig. And you're you're in there, you're you're moving around. You you get a cover and like that kind of sets you in your rhythm. And it's like okay, this is what I've done a billion times. I'm I'm comfortable now. I just, and now it kind of shifts over to muscle memory. And it's the same thing with outside with like anybody that is involved in spiking, which I've talked to my setters a lot about. This is like the first couple balls in the match. Just give me a couple balls in system and like let me feel the rhythm and let me get going a little bit. Then to like do whatever you want to do, and then I feel comfortable with my serve, with my ability to pass. Everything kind of just levels out. Um, so I think that's a big thing for me is just being able to understand that I'm like this, and I need to okay. I'm just going to slow things down and get into my rhythm if I can, of course. But if teams are bombing balls at you and you don't get the first couple sets, or you get the first two sets, you get a high balls and you whack them right in the middle of the net, and then you miss your first serve. It's like, dude, this is a sinking ship. I'm just going to wave my flag. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Stop. <laughs> you're just like, yeah. I'm just the recycle guy. Just give me balls to recycle. I'm not swinging any more balls. Put me back in opposite, coach. Give me an opposite over here. <laughs> but hey, I want to. Ch- I'm gonna, really quick. Few questions here. I'm gonna ch- completely change. I'm gonna keep telling. You, hey, a few more questions. Two hours. Yeah, later. Dude, I come on. But, hey, don't worry about it. Um, it's completely t- tone switch here. Um. Because obviously you, you played a AVP on a whim. That was actually the last time we talked to you. You played AVP with Nick Lucena on a whim here. Have you been given thought to, you know, hanging up the indoor shoes for some for some sand socks for the AVP <laughs> sand socks. for the for the AVP tour? <laughs> FIVB. Uh, yeah. No, I've definitely. I've, I, mean, I've def- I think we talked about this. This is the, oh, almost an identical question last time we talked to. Oh yeah. Uh, Every yeah, two years, baby. I- <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah definitely looking for a partner man <laughs> <laughs> that's good because i'm looking for a blocker so. Get the big we're, the we're big just... yellow bus back there behind your <laughs> so yeah i thought about it but I, I i really don't know what what all that looks like you know especially in terms of the biggest thing for me is, is do i continue to enjoy this game you know, because if the, if the love, some ways, God forbid, that it's just kind of taken out of the sport for me, that's – if my body can do it, great. I'm not going to force myself to do it. As long as I'm still in love with the sport, I'll play it as long, whatever scenario, indoor, beach, sand socks, grass, whatever. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. Good man. So, so last question here. <laughs> the last question. <laughs> So, so last so, question so, before my next so last question, question of this segment. <laughs> last question of before my next question. Uh, so, I I used to be pretty ignorant in terms of the beach volleyball versus indoor volleyball debate, which is harder, you know. And the one thing that's kind of changed my mind. I'm not saying I. So I always thought that be, indoor volleyball was a lot easier than beach volleyball. And I'll explain my thinking here in a second. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. I think you were the opposite. You didn't nope, think no, that. I said indoor. You did not think that. No, oh my bad. Indoor volleyball <laughs> is much harder than beach volleyball, and, okay. I, and I'll explain myself. Um, but then what kind of changed my mind? Not changed my mind, but is really starting to kind of open my eyes. Is and Joe pointing this out to me, especially on the podcast here. Is 
I was just kind of like maybe looking at just the AVP when I was like, I needed to kind of look at it from a world perspective in terms of FIVB and just the, the, the generational growth that's just been happening in both size, physicality, and just all around skill at those size and how physical they are and how they can do the all around game. Um, but what, what I guess my, my argument shifted to, at an, it's the same thing as, a, as an opposite. When you're an opposite or a middle, it's the easiest volleyball, easiest position, or middle's the easiest position in volleyball. Or libero can be the same thing um, at like a super basic level, right? You just stand back there, they put the dorky kid back there or the guy <laughs> that can't really do anything in either positions, right? And they, the middle, and, then, and bam, you don't really notice them, right? But same thing, and same thing for same thing for beach volleyball. You get a guy who's <laughs> decent. Here's the thing. Here's, literally, I just here's got the, the thing. funniest. Listen, oh, listen, okay, go. listen. And then, and then, same thing. You get think about like in college and club. It was always like your fourth string outside who was winning all these beach tournaments, who was doing well at beach volleyball because they could be decent at all the positions rather than at indoor volleyball. You get to a point, and this is my main reason. Where okay, maybe they don't have as many jobs, but they're doing those jobs at such way higher level than those beach guys are. And that was my argument with that. So my question to you is, what do you feel is easier, beach or indoor? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I guess let's just start it off with let's let's pick a level of both mm -hmm. that we're talking about because we're the not talking highest about of highs. elementary. Yeah, we're not talking about elementary liberals here. Right. We're gonna go the highest of highs. So we're talking FIVB World Tour, ADPs up there somewhere, and then like international professional volleyball. Yep. Um. <sighs> I, th I think I'm going to stick with my same old answer and kind of go off exactly what you said, but just kind of flip it. Uh, but I'll, I, you know, what? I'll do one better. I'll give you an example. And I know I'm really good friends with him, so he wouldn't mind me using this example. Um, you all know who Jeff Jendrick is, correct? Yes. Yes. Imagine Jeff Jendrick on the beach. <laughs> Smooth. Smooth, <laughs> butter, <laughs> calm, cool, collected. Cut yeah. shots, jungle, jungle cat, cut shots jungle cat, <laughs> ball <laughs> control. Got all the touches in the game. Dude, he would have, comes to mind. He would have some sick crypto Sauce. sponsors yeah. for sure. He has yes, some sick crypto sponsors. Yeah. Have you ever seen that man set a ball on the indoor? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey, if you block <laughs> every ball, you don't need to set anything. anything. On two else. or blocks. On two or blocks. That's all I gotta say. Stick to your strengths, boys. You know your strengths. You know City boys are up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but so you think that beach is harder? I think in order to be a beach volleyball player at the highest level, I think it takes a lot more skill, a lot more patience, a lot more understanding that it's two on two. You don't have six other players to potentially bail you out or help you in certain situations. Um, and the overall knowledge it takes to be able to go against another team with knowledge as well and a high level IQ, dude, beach volleyball is insanely hard. You would never, someone who's never played the sport a day in your life, you'd never go, hey, beach volleyball is the route for you. You'd be like, dude, let's get you on the indoor. Let's get you to pass some balls and see how everything kind of develops. Get the I don't know. Ball. You would not throw them on the beach. <laughs> Be like, well, let's get dude, going. No, listen, because it's listen. more easily accessible on the beach, and you have to do all those things, so you get better at them, right? But in terms of reach the next level, that's where I'm like, okay, indoor. Okay, but all right, last question here. Wait, uh, no, no, don't, don't, <laughs> no, no Dave, you don't get listen. To the thing is, for example, what Christian Sorum does, his like he gets served every single ball insides out. A, it's such a crazy high rate. The mental, like the competitive. Uh, what is it called? Fortitude. fortitude. Mental fortitude. fortitude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Teamwork. It's not teamwork. Teamwork. Like, that's a huge after part of ball, it. After ball There's after no ball. There's no bailing you out. When you're getting served and you're in the like you're in the bottom, there's no like, hey, could you get me some good balls? Like, <laughs> could you do this? Could you do that? Like, there's none of that. It's right. tough. Beach is tough. Okay, but let me spin it like this though. Let me let me say, okay, highest outside, right? That has to do all around, just like a beach player does. The highest level of playing outside in the indoor game versus the beach player. You see what I'll, I'll be honest. You see what's like Taylor Sander. There's a learning curve right now for him. Like he hopped out there, but I think Taylor should be. He's not in the right situation. I think he should be defending. Okay, no matter what, back row. Still, like he's not no, dominating. Taylor, no, like, no, but Taylor Sander offensively he played is. beach before, and that guy's a beast. 
Yeah. No, I think bad example. I think bad he example. He is a beast. Bad example. But I have Nay. one 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 little point for you guys that I will definitely I helps your point. I what the one thing I think is negative about indoor volleyball is uh in terms of developing as a player is they 100% compartmentalize different players for their different physical attributes. <clears throat> they 100% t- they t- that's I mean that's Jeff's case. He was 67, 68, 69, 610 his entire life. He never got taught how to set a ball. Since never the day he was born. Yeah, came out the womb. 6'8". <laughs> damn. <laughs> this ain't no damn fetus. <laughs> Grown ass man. It's a robot. <laughs> so that, that, that's one of the negative things about coming into like the yeah. indoor volleyball setting is that he he's like, oh, you're tall. This is what you're going to do, and you're never going to learn how to do the other things. Yeah. <clears throat> True. True. So All right. that, that, that doesn't help, but... I think beach I get what you're saying. Yeah. I will say I'm, I'm becoming less ignorant to it. So thank you also, for that. Also, like the off the court stuff of beach ball, like the physicality, like to be able to train cardio that we don't have to do at all. And also like booking oh. your own flights and like. That's like the lifestyle is like, way. And the fact that you don't have a salary at some points, like every you game you play, win it. you win or you go home and you lost money. Like we, yeah. we're getting our. We're getting our money whether we lose or win. These guys are showing up, and it's like, imagine the, you flew to Australia. You're in the qualifier, and you're at 19, 19, you're like, this could go one of two ways. I'm either, in, I'm either like broke and can't eat for the next month, or like I'm into the next round, and I finally like are into the money rounds. Like that's, that's re- like, There's a whole lot more than just the playing of beach volleyball that makes it that's true. a harder yeah. profession than indoor. 100%. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. So we're going to play a quick game here. You have three words to describe each. Uh, well, basically, you've been playing for international ball for a long time. You've been playing against all the top players in the world, right? In all top countries. So one thing we like to do with our podcast guests is uh, I'm going to say the name of a country. You have three words or less. You can say one word if you want to describe their style of play and like the first word that comes to mind or first three words that come to mind in their style of volleyball play. So okay. I'll name them, and then you go as fast as you can, and then men's we'll indoor. Men's men's indoor. Sorry. All right, you ready? <laughs> Got it. Here we are. First one, Poland. Uh, technical. Technical, gifted, and roots. Ooh, Brazil. Uh. <laughs> IQ training and mentality Japan training um, analytics and understanding French lucky no I'm kidding uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Bastards. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd say gifted. What would be a good word for? They know how to take advantage of what they have. That's fair. Uh, I don't know what I'd say for what what that word would be, but that's three words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'll say. <laughs> and last one, USA. Um, origins. Uh, work ethic. And just history, I guess. Good man. Good man. TJ, they can on the pod, brother. There's a cat. Every time I see a cat, I'm like, cat, cat. I'm like, cat. Gage. <laughs> Yeah, I picked her up off the street. <laughs> Doctor Doolittle over there in Turkey. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you guys for having me. It's so much fun every time. I get to hey, you're the man. Yeah, this. dude. Thanks for doing this. Hey, with you that did. being said, just remember if you can't handle the heat, goddamn kitchen. This has been another episode presented by Out of System.